Well, good morning and uh, welcome to our final um, Ireland is a virtual speaker series and probably one of the most important ones. Uh, my name is Robert O'Driscoll. I'm Ireland's uh, Consul General here in San Francisco. Um, and today we're partnering with the uh, Dutch Consul here in San Francisco, our, our good friends, um, the Netherlands, uh, and also um, with the California Legislative LGBT Q Plus Caucus uh, to deliver this event on um, bringing together perspectives of from Ireland, uh, from Netherlands and from California uh, about LGBTQ rights uh, at the start of the San Francisco Pride weekend. I think as an Irish person, and I'm told this regularly in all my travels all across, uh, all across um, uh, the West, the Western region that I cover, um, there was probably no prouder day for a lot of people than the 22nd of May uh, 2015 um, when we um, voted by popular referendum for marriage equality in Ireland. It really, I think, was a moment which captured um, probably almost two decades of, um, of a move towards a more progressive uh, space in our politics uh, and was a real moment of pride, not just for, not just for Irish born people, but for people of Irish descent. And I, I see uh, Council Member Joe McDermott uh, from uh, King County is on the line as well. I know he has spoken to me about the pride that he felt that day as an Irish American uh, in, in, in that vote. Uh, and since then, of course, um, there's been a number of other, 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 uh, other um, um, uh, legislative changes in Ireland. One, obviously, the 2015 uh, Gender Recognition Bill. Uh, and in 2018, we, are, we, we, we launched it, the, the National LGBTI plus youth strategy. I think it's the first of its kind in the entire world. Um, but a lot done, and as a very old uh, uh, political saying was, a lot done, a lot, a lot more to do. And today's conversation is really about that. It's about asking ourselves, well, you know, what, what have we achieved? Uh, what more can be done? Um, and how can Ireland, uh, Netherlands, and the European Union as a bloc and the California with the leadership role it's always shown, including, of course, the governor here who brought in a marriage equality in San Francisco in 2004 here as, as mayor. What can, what can here the, the U.S. do, not just in our respective countries or in our respective larger political systems, but also in third countries around the world? So for this, uh, for this conversation, we've, we've assembled, and I think I, I, I have no shame in saying this, uh, we, we've assembled an absolutely rock star panel uh, for this conversation. Uh, all the way from Ireland, she's sitting currently in Mayo, one of the most beautiful counties in our, in our, in our wonderful country. Maria Walsh, MEP, a member of the European Parliament for the Midlands and the Northwest, and also Vice Chair of the European Parliament's LGBTI uh, group. Uh, Senator Boris uh, Dietrich in the, in the Dutch Senate, former advocacy director for the LGBT rights program um, for Human Rights Watch. Uh, State Senator Scott Weiner, or California Senator Scott Weiner. Uh, obviously, also a former supervisor here in San Francisco and chair of the California uh, Senate's uh, California Legislature's LGBTQI plus caucus. Uh, and this conversation will be moderated by Dustin Gardner, a journalist with the San Francisco Chronicle. Uh, if you get a chance to read him, he writes some great stuff. Uh, and member of the uh, NLGJA Association of LGBTQ Journalists here in the U.S. Uh, we're really looking forward to this conversation today. I'm going to pass it over to Dustin now and let him take it on from here. Go to the Enjoy the conversation. Well, thank, thanks so much for having me and happy Pride to everybody in San Francisco and Dublin. Um, I thought to get started, it might be interesting to ask some questions to introduce our speakers. Um, and let's start with Senator Dietrich. Um, you were at the forefront of the fight for marriage equality in the Netherlands. The Netherlands was the first country in 2001 to adopt marriage equality. Uh, in the 20 years since that time, more, more than, I think, 29 countries have followed suit. More than a billion people now live in countries with marriage equality. How do you feel that the Netherlands being first has influenced the fight for LGBT equality beyond marriage? Well, thank you very much for that question, uh, Dustin. And uh, wonderful to be here in this program. It's really an honor for me to be here. Um, to answer your question, what I noticed in the Netherlands, you know, I started a marriage equality debate in the Dutch parliament in 1994. So it took about seven years, 2001, until we achieved marriage equality. It took so much energy and resources, also human resources from the LGBTQ community that once we achieved marriage equality, 
it seemed like everything died down a bit. And it took really several years before a new agenda uh, was going to be developed uh, in terms of what else do we need in terms of full equality. And I think so, um, lots of countries, governments, but also NGOs were very interested in the Dutch situation because we were the first with marriage equality. So they invited us to come and speak about marriage equality. And then it was always my intention to broaden the agenda and say, listen, marriage equality is of course important, but there are other things that are maybe even more important when it comes to the daily life of LGBTQ people in terms of homelessness or bullying in schools or uh, discrimination in the workplace. You know, we, we developed a whole agenda and it was my intention to, to roll out that agenda in other countries and uh, try to stimulate people not to focus completely on marriage equality, but also on the other issues. And uh, the Netherlands is a small country, so we always are looking for ways to collaborate with other countries, either in the EU or at the United Nations, for instance. Uh, we are part of a core group of countries to further LGBTQ rights around the world. And so through other um, uh, organizations, um, institutions, we are trying to, um, you know, to um, show uh, and share our experiences, um, not only when we are talking about uh, sexual orientation, but of course also gender identity, trans rights, and also the rights of intersex people. And so we developed the whole agenda and, um, you know, in collaboration with other countries and other NGOs, uh, this has, you know, become some kind of global movement. Well, we'll just get back to some of that unfinished business in a moment. Um, to continue introducing the panel here, we also have Maria Walsh, a par parliamentarian with the European Union. Uh, you, you first kind of rose to national prominence in Ireland uh, when you won the 2014 Rose of Tralee, and you publicly disclosed a couple days later, publicly shared that, uh, th that you are a lesbian a few days later. And I'm curious, uh, what, what do you hear about uh, when, you, when you talk to LGBT people in Ireland what do they still say about that moment? What do you hear from young people in particular? Yeah, and, oh, well, first and foremost, thanks very much for having me on. I think this is a really, uh, when you can bring different time zones and different insights and personalities into a conversation, particularly this important one around pride, um, it's, uh, as Robert said, it's, it's a pretty rock star moment when you get to, to get to share some insights. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I am, um, you know, a funny case when it comes to the public space and, and being very comfortable in my sexuality and, and now representing um, my constituency of Midlands Northwest. So uh, 13 counties in Ireland um, uh, now in the European Parliament. But, you know, to track it back and bring in the, the where, where I came from and how I was first introduced to to, to Ireland as a whole was as a part of uh, the International Rosa Tree Festival. I represented Philadelphia. That's where I was living at the time. Um, and for me, I had been uh, living as a gay woman for, for a number of years. Um, and when, my, when I was crowned in, in August of 2014, um, indeed, a couple of days later, it was uh, on the front of the, the tabloids. Um, and it's a very bizarre experience when you see your, the most uh, probably private part of who you are as an individual being discussed on such an open forum. But um, for me, it, there was such overwhelming positivity. Uh, for anybody watching, the International Rose of Tralee is, is a festival that celebrates um, the modern woman, uh, talks about uh, what she in, in the Irish context and you know our diaspora that ever-growing Irish community so we have centers uh, right throughout the world um, and it's really about celebrating who you are and the, the many chapters that you bring um, to a conversation and you get to talk about and um, but it's quite a controversial festival here in the sense it's it, it, it's deemed quite traditional um, quite Catholic based um, and then catapult uh, a gay rose with short hair and tattoos um, it, it kind of <laughs> went a bit as you can imagine uh, it, it caught the media by storm and it was of interest um, but what was what was overwhelming to to me both myself and, and my family and, and of course the International Rosa Festival as a whole was the positivity around it of course you did have 
uh, a little bit of um, negative noise being on social media, but overwhelmingly it was, it was one of welcome. It was one of, um, well, this is a modern festival. Um, this is what it should look like. Um, I, I, if I, I opened up quite quickly into traveling the length and breadth of Ireland, uh, talking to schools, being invited in from LGBTQI, uh, young, young people across our senior cycle, um, what we call secondary schools, but high schools in the States. And, and the conversation just really formed for there. And it was, it was, it was, it was a welcoming space, um, both for myself and, and of course a safe space for, for younger people to really reach out and, and, and get involved. I, I'm really fortunate to say we, we, my family and I got many letters from younger people saying, you know, having your sexuality on the front of a newspaper just offered a space for a conversation around the dinner table across Ireland. Um, and younger people just began to, to slowly open up to those around them, friends and, and family. Um, but, uh, I will say it was on a on a very personal level. It was um, it was it was an honour. It was quite remarkable because while crowned in August 2014, a number of months later, May 2015, we passed the marriage referendum. Um, and while I was in a part of an apolitical festival, um, as you can imagine, I'm not too short of a few words, and I have no problem rubbing elbows and making people open up to conversation. And we certainly did that uh, with respect to the festival, but to be uh, to be to be crowned when I was at, at one of the greatest historic moments of our country was something that um, was 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 a personal wow moment for me. Yeah. I can imagine. Um, let's get to State Senator uh, Scott Weiner. Scott Weiner um, in the California Senate. You you have been an author of several landmark state laws dealing with LGBT rights um, from things like HIV prevention drugs to adding a third gender uh, non-binary category on government documents. What, what are some of the, 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 the legi what is some of the legislation you're most proud of and what do you see as some of the, the biggest unfinished business on your plate this session? Uh, sure, uh, thank you for, uh, for having me and uh, it's a real honor uh, to be here. And I also apologize that we're voting on the Senate floor all day today. And so I'm gonna have to leave at about 10 o'clock. So my my apologies uh, for that. Um, yeah, I, so I uh, agree with uh, Senator Dietrich that, uh, you know, we had these huge wins, some of these huge wins, especially around marriage equality. Um, and I think a lot of people thought, well, we're done. And of course, <laughs> we're, we're not even close to done. And I, I, it was interesting that uh, a week ago, or last week, when the U.S. Supreme Court uh, ruled that uh, federal employment protections apply to based on sexual orientation and gender identity as well, a lot of people said to me, oh, uh, I thought that was already the law. And of course, that in most of the US, there were no protections for anything, housing, uh, employment. And there's, so we have a lot of that basic civil rights work to do. But even here in California, California, where very progressive California, where we have you know strong laws in the books around uh, discrimination protections, uh, we still are way behind, frankly, on some issues. So, for example, um, we continue in California in 2020 uh, to criminalize LGBTQ uh, people in various ways. Uh, we know that uh, criminalization of sex work uh, disproportionately uh, harms uh, women, but disproportionately harms LGBTQ people and especially trans women. Uh, and uh, so that's something that we've been trying to make some progress on. I passed legislation last year to start moving in that direction and to say you can't uh, use possession of condoms as evidence of sex work and you can't arrest a sex worker who's reporting a violent crime. Um, we continue to uh, frankly abuse transgender people in our prison system uh, for example, uh, trans people in our prison system are housed according to their birth assigned gender, not their gender identity. So trans women in prison are housed in male facilities. And you can imagine some of the problems that that creates and just brutalization of, of these women. So we are work moving forward legislation this year to allow trans people in prison to choose to be uh, housed according to their uh, gender identity. Uh, we continue in 2020 California 
uh, to force LGBTQ people onto the sex offender registry, even though they haven't victimized uh, anyone. We know that the sex offender registry is not just about violent predators, uh, that, that we have uh, gay men who had sex in the park in 1960 who are still on our registry 60 years later. We've done some work to try to give them a path off of that registry. And we have legislation this year to deal with the fact that under our sex laws in California, um, gay sex, anything, in other words, anything other than penile vaginal sex is treated more harshly. You're penalized more, you are forced under the sex offender registry without any discretion of the, of the judge. If there's like an 18 year old having sex with their 17 year old partner, the straight people can stay off the registry, the gay people get put onto uh, the registry. Uh, it was only in 2017 that we repealed our HIV criminalization uh, laws. Uh, we continue to have high rates of homelessness in the LGBTQ community, including almost half of homeless youth are LGBTQ. Uh, and we, are, we continue not to collect data, health data, on LGBTQ people. Uh, and with COVID-19, I have legislation now to force the state to start, if you're asking about race and age and gender, you need to ask about sexual orientation and gender identity too, because we know that we have heightened risk factors, but we're collecting no data. And then finally, um, uh, we, we have, I have now tried for a couple of years to pass legislation to ban medically unnecessary genital reconstruction surgery on intersex babies. Uh, uh, these babies that are born with atypical genitalia, they're perfectly healthy. There is nothing uh, health-wise wrong with them, but their genitals are not what we have traditionally considered typical or, or quote unquote normal. And so they perform very invasive and dangerous genital reconstruction surgery to assign a gender to these babies that might be the wrong gender and that might create lifelong um, uh, uh, after effects physically or, or, or psychologically. Uh, and so we want to just wait until that kid can at least decide whether they want the surgery and what their gender is. Uh, and we have hit a wall for two years now. So we've had made enor enormous progress in progressive California uh, and we have enormous work to do and people should never assume that it's all good because we have work to do. Well, thanks for giving us that uh, overview of your very broad agenda um, this session. I know you've got to run um, back to the floor for votes in a moment. So I'm gonna stick with you for our next uh, question here. Um, th this weekend is Pride in both Dublin and San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And you know, Pride, there's been a lot of discussion this year it, it, with the protests over police brutality, racial injustice in the United States about the origins of Pride as a protest movement. How do you feel that Pride has evolved in, in the Bay Area, in San Francisco over the years? Has it stayed true to those roots? Or do you feel like it's become overly corporate? Well, I think that Pride has absolutely changed. And you're right, Pride started 50 years ago as a protest. Um, it was, uh, you know, we had basically riots at Stonewall is the most famous. But before that was Compton's Cafeteria in the Tenderloin in San Francisco, where trans women rose up against police brutality. Uh, and then you had the Black Cat in Los Angeles. And so we had you know, various uprisings of our community um, against uh, police brutality, police oppression, and, and societal oppression that our, our bars um, you know, for many years, for, forever have been where our community has gathered and connected and safe spaces. Uh, and we had the police who would come and raid these bars and try to destroy people's lives. And finally, our community said, you know what, no more, you're not doing this to us anymore. Uh, and it was very brave and they risked their lives. Uh, and uh, you know, th these are people who, who are heroes. Uh, and, um, and that's what triggered the first pride in New York and San Francisco and LA. Um, and we have to always remember that. And what's happening today with the long overdue awakening and opening of society's eyes towards uh, the police brutality uh, and not just police brutality. Remember, that's just the first entry point into the criminal justice system. And even if even if nothing goes awry, violence-wise, with the arrest, then you go into a criminal justice system in the U.S. that is completely racist and broken, uh, and destroys and tears apart um, communities, particularly communities of color and particularly Black communities. Uh, and so, uh, our um, my hope.
hope is that, first of all, that Pride this year, that we're getting back to our roots. And in San Francisco, even though Pride was canceled, the physical Pride, there is going to be a large protest march on Sunday. So we are going back to our roots um, uh, about what Pride really is. Uh, and in terms of what Pride has been in recent years, you know, I, I, I understand the pushback against the corporate participation. I get that. On the other hand, um, as you know, so many people are participating in Pride. And when you, a Google or a Facebook brings 5,000 or 7,000 employees to the Pride Parade, it, that has some downsides in terms of, in some sense, moving Pride away from what it was. But on the other hand, it, it, there are so many people who want to be part of the parade and they want to get up early on a Sunday morning to go out and be part of this amazing event. So I, I, I think it's, we can do both, have this broad-based pride. But as we're seeing with the protests that are happening now, those are very broad-based too, with a lot of people being pulled in who have never gone to a protest in their life, who have never um, you know, been active around racial justice before. So I think being inclusive and pulling people in is a good thing, but we should always stay true to the roots of this amazing movement. Boris, what, what are your thoughts on this question? When you see pride in the Netherlands, in Europe, do you feel like it has stayed true to its protest roots? Are there concerns about a corporate influence there as well? Yes, actually, that's a very topical uh, discussion at the moment. Uh, we also canceled our canal pride, we call it. It's the Dutch pride on the canals in Amsterdam and it has some uh, half a million to a million spectators. So it's a real big thing. It's actually the biggest event in the country every year. Um, but there has been some pushback because, you know, uh, uh, companies, um, they have their floats or their boats, we call it. And a lot of people said, well, it's, it's too corporate and we need to go back to the roots who, you know, we need to f uh, further the human rights agenda. That should be central. And so what we see in the last couple of years, and I am really supportive of this, is that around the pride itself, actually in the week before the pride itself, there are all kinds of uh, human rights events or religious events in churches dealing with LGBTQ issues. And so there, and there are theater plays and, you know, so there, there's this whole festival kind of atmosphere. And then as a culmination, uh, the conclusion of that week, that's the Canal Pride. Um, and so next year uh, will be the first physical uh, Pride again. Um, if of course uh, uh, the coronavirus uh, is away by then. Um, but uh, yeah, the discussion is uh, not only a corporate influence, there was also criticism that uh, it was a very white event. And so we need to include other groups as well. And so I'm now the ambassador of the uh, Dutch Pride in Amsterdam with a group of other ambassadors. And they are people of color and they are trying to get other communities in and you know, get them well represented because, um, yeah, it's important that people understand that um, if you talk about discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity, uh, it affects not only uh, the LGBT community, but actually society at large. And so it's important that we reach out to other allies, other groups um, to support us and to show intersectional um, solidarity and um, in terms of the whole uh, racism debate which uh, started of course in the US with the uh, murder of uh, George Floyd but it also spread out to Europe and to the Netherlands so we had very uh, many um, 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 discussions but also protest marches and there is actually the same thing um, Black Lives Matter is not something for black people, it's for everybody, for other groups as well. And so uh, other groups sh should show solidarity with people of color who are discriminated based on their race or their skin color. And so we should understand that discrimination is a poison that affects society at large and not only the uh, affected group. And so this is something 
an idea that we uh, need to develop further when we talk about the new uh, Canal Pride in 2021. Maria, how do you see pride in Ireland? Has it stayed true to that sort of intersectional protest movement? Well, this is where if you ask, um, if you ask uh, pride organizers probably here and, and there is smaller prides in, in quite rural parts of Ireland and obviously Dublin would be our main one. Um, you know, some in, in the community, the rainbow community are, are anti, um, are, are anti corporate support while others uh, and I include myself in that, it's a part of an education stream. You know, we were really fortunate a number of years ago, post recession here in, in Ireland in, in 2008, 2009, that um, large multinationals were coming in in the tech sector, particularly like your Facebook, your LinkedIn's, your Twitters of the world. And they almost, well, dare I say, they, they, they forced Irish institutions, like our banking sector or, or um, our, civil, our civil servants um, organizations, governmental organizations, to start looking at um, employment and, uh, and rainbow groups, diversity groups within, within employment. Um, and for, can, I, for, can I pause you there real quick? I, it sounds like Senator Weiner has to run, so I yeah. just want to thank you for joining us, Scott. Uh, really thank you, and my apologies for disrupting this. I have to get back to the floor to vote. So have a wonderful Pride, everyone. Thank you. Have a good one, Wonderful Senator. meeting you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. The day job doesn't end, even if Pride is on, which is unfortunate, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> Very true. Um, so sorry, you were saying about the influence of some yeah, of these. So, uh, uh, yeah, and I think, I think the influence of, of having an inclusive Pride with corporate organizations, um, as I said, like almost, I hate to say it, but almost embarrassed Irish institution leads to, to start looking at their own d and um, and belonging within their company. So, in one sense, it helped remarkably well to recognize that we need to start looking at employment um, and, and diversity, inclusion, and belonging within the space, particularly around LGBTQI or, um, or, or as Boris has shared there in terms of um, other minority groups and, and really represent um, our communities uh, uh, rightfully. Um, and then the other side, then I understand, you know, we. Pride, pride happened in Ireland. The, the biggest pride movement in Irish history was after the murder of, of a gay man. Um, and we can't lose sight of the fact that we are, pride is a protest movement. It is us to recognize um, the thousands, particularly in Ireland, the thousands of Irish men and women who um, unfortunately lost their lives or were, were forced to, to leave the, the, the country um, where they were born because of the fact that discrimination it was rife. Um, so it goes hand in hand. For me, I, I love the fact that we have uh, a, as much inclusivity in colour as we can in Pride, that we have not just, um, you know, one type of our rainbow family, but we have all represented that you have younger people looking up into floats or those walking with, with, with passion of, of wanting to understand why pride took place. I do think we have to do um, an awful lot of work on the education of, you know, pride history rep and respect those that paved the way for us to walk hand in hand flags around our shoulders in unison um, and why it is so important and um, and Boris has shared there like you know we see movements of, of far right groups um, with, within the European Union and how quickly discrimination arises when given opportunity to so I think Pride next year in 2021 will be um, a beautiful mix of the heart of a protest with the colour and the support of, of, our, of our corporates, which um, in one sense is, is rightly so. There's, there's one thing I would like to add, Dustin, if that's okay with you. Sure. Please go ahead. Um, I forgot to mention this. There is also a debate that in the Netherlands, the Canal Pride has been so much accepted and adopted also by, let's say, the straight community that it's very cool for, let's say, heterosexual people to be there and to show their support, that in the LGBTQ community, um, some people are worried that, you know, they become almost invisible because it's such a large crowd. We, we are talking about almost one million people in Amsterdam during those days. Um, so that is something 
which is actually wonderful if you go back to the origin of the pride because we wanted to convince uh, other people in society that it's okay to be LGBTQ and that we belong in society and we should be uh, treated with respect and dignity and have equal rights. Now that we have achieved most of that, um, it's still important to be visible as a group, as a community. And so we need to find a balance in uh, sharing our experiences with uh, straight people and also being on the forefront of furthering our own agenda of trying to achieve full uh, equality. Shifting gears a bit here, um, you're both at different levels of government. Uh, Boris, you're in, in the Dutch Senate. Maria, you're in the European Parliament. I I'm curious um, how you see the work at different levels of government. And we just had uh, Senator Scott Weiner here with us from the California legislature in the US, also a pioneer in LGBT rights. But I'm curious how you um, have been influenced by work at different levels of government, either across the Atlantic or in Europe. How has th that interplay of ideas and, and efforts influenced your work over the years? Um, I guess, Boris, do you want to start with that? Yeah, I find it quite a difficult question, actually, but... Um... Which is why I'm delighted he started with him. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but there are some, uh, let's say, topics uh, that have to do with LGBTQ people. Let's take the issue of refugees coming from Africa, trying to get into Europe. And uh, Maria was talking about the far right already. There's a very harsh discourse about a sealing of Europe uh, from uh, people who uh, try to find refuge and try to find asylum. And of course, there are many uh, LGBTQ asylum seekers as well. And um, I worry that, um, you know, we, we cannot help them because of this, br this broader discussion about refugee rights. And so it's very important always to, to try to see where do we need to support our people, um, even if it's on different agendas. And um, then you have to deal, of course, with different institutions uh, that deal with immigration, for instance trying to get them on board and trying to uh, get them educated about what it is if you are lesbian or if you are trans and you need to flee your country because your life is at danger that you really uh, need to find a place to live and be free um, free from violence and discrimination and so um, the experience i got through my work in the dutch uh, um, parliament I can use in order to influence others and other institutions to um, be mindful of the problems that are um, really something that is, uh, you know, that are very important to LGBTQ people in different uh, parts of society. Maria, how do you see that? How have you been influenced by work at, at, in different countries in the US, uh, different levels of government? Yeah, I think, uh, and, and picking up from what Boris has shared there, I think gone are the days where it's just one country um, trying to work on its own and rise above discrimination, um, you know, hate speech, or in this sense, um, LGBTQI rights. The waves of uh, people's movements of grassroots uh, developments coming from the States it has been instrumental, and Boris can probably add to that. I mean, uh, what we're seeing now in the States around um, around Black Lives Matter, around that entire movement, is not just singular to the United States of America. You know, it, we, 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 we watched with horror as parliamentarians um, the, 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 the impact um, the murder of George Floyd had um, in, in the United States, and we've discussed it at length in the parliament, um, where, an, you know, a resolution in honor of George Floyd will come to the floor. So it, it's, it's, it, it's very fluid in that sense. Um, I think gone are the days where uh, that people are now okay to stay under the blankets and maybe not embrace themselves or, or embrace their own voice or beliefs within a, a people's movement is now gone, which in, in many ways 
thankfully that is the case. We just need to make sure um, it's an equal balance. And, and, and as I said earlier, and Boris picked up around that far right movement, um, on a European front, uh, we have a hell of a lot more work to do in terms of LGBTQI rights. Um, when you look at countries, even in this pandemic uh, that COVID has brought to us, shifting back and, and moving the goalposts, as we say in Ireland, mm -hmm. around, around supports around our rainbow communities, particularly in the likes of Poland uh, and Hungary. One of the first files I worked on, a resolution in the parliament as a new parliamentarian, as someone who's very comfortable in their own skin um, and sits within the European People's Party, which would be deemed centre-right. I'm a very progressive centre uh, uh, parliamentarian, but one of, one, of the, one, of the, one of the first resolutions I worked on is um, LGBTQI resolution on the, on the Pol Poland's uh, free zones. And trying to explain that here to the media in Ireland, that in a country not too far away from us is um, a state newspaper and, and a government encouraging people to, in businesses, to put stickers in their windows um, with an X around the rainbow flag to say you're not welcome here was mind boggling to Irish people because in, in 2015, not that everything has been fixed at that vote in the marriage referendum here in Ireland, but we certainly woke up to the fact that our brothers and sisters are just as entitled as we are to, to, to marry who we want to marry, to work where we want to work, to be as comfortable as we want to be in our communities. Um, so, and, and, and before I go down the rabbit hole of discussing Hungary and, and I, I sit within the party of Fidesz, which is the government in Hungary right now, you know, the backpedaling we see there on over COVID, um, particularly around trans and gender recognition has been horrifying to watch. Um, but we need to shift the conversation and we need to ensure that discrimination, LGBTQI rights, um, protection of our citizens don't just stop around the economy or the currency or the trade deals. Um, the, the, the comfort we have or, or the decision makers have, the hierarchy of council and, and the commission had previous to this mandate um, of saying, well, that's a competency of the, the national member state. That's a competency of them to decide whether they want to act on it or not. Whereas I, I truly believe funding should be enacted. If you are not if you are not stepping up to the plate protecting your citizens, regardless of their color, creed or orientation, then, then funding needs to be retracted. Um, mm. So within that, we have a lot of work to do. I, you can tell I get a little bit heated up when we start, when we start stepping back because waves like Ireland, I mean, we, we, we only passed uh, the decriminalization of, of LGBTQI in 1993. Like that's my maths are always not great, but that's about 27 years ago. Um, we, we were, quite alike Poland at the time. And when you think five years ago, we've embraced um, uh, our LGBTQI community members, whereas in countries like Poland and Hungary, there seem to be retracting. So we need to ensure that, um, mm -hmm. as Boris assured, that the people who are coming to our shores, people who are moving in the European Union, people who are coming from left or right of us, and I mean the United States from uh, and to, to Australia is traveling with the rights of being who they want to be, not just being restricted based off the country they decide to, to reside in. I'd like to pick on uh, one thing, one aspect Maria said, and that's actually that when you talk about LGBTQ rights, it's a global movement. It's not a national movement anymore. And uh, so for, for me, it's uh, wonderful that, and I'm very honored that I was elected to become a part of the organization of security and corporation in Europe, the OSCE. And it sounds very European, but the United States is also a member and Canada is, and also Russia. And that's actually the only organization where the US and Russia and Europe are meeting each other. It's only members of parliament, national members of parliament. And um, the interesting thing is that LGBTQ rights have never been really properly addressed in that organization. So for me, it's very important and it's one of my goals uh, based on um, previous experiences and, uh, you know, influenced by NGOs who are working tireless, tirelessly on this topic to include that topic in the OSCE and try to give a push back to countries like Poland or Hungary or the US with President Trump or other uh, you know, countries in Latin America, for instance, 
think of Brazil, um, to see uh, how we can really push our agenda and uh, talk about dignity of, and human rights. Maria, you had talked about some of the impacts of COVID-19 on LGBT communities around uh, Europe and the world. I was curious, um, Senator Weider talked on, touched on this a little earlier, this concern about the, the dis disproportionate impact on the community given higher rates of HIV, other pre-existing medical conditions, higher rates of homelessness, uh, particularly in the U.S. What, what work do you think um, needs to be done to monitor this and make sure that there isn't uh, a disproportionate impact in the LGBT community that's going unnoticed with COVID. Uh, yeah, and a fantastic, a fantastic question because it's not just um, it's not just what we assume or what we see on paper that that impacts our community members, particularly around around COVID. Um, for me, I, I I talk about LGBTQI rights and and um, with with passion and vigor as I do around mental health supports uh, with the same, and that's for all citizens, uh, regardless of your race, creed, or orientation. I think we what we're coming out of COVID, and hopefully we won't be stepping into a second wave, um, would be just that that support around mental health that those who are community members, our rainbow community members, who you know, I'm, I, I'm calling you from, from the west coast of Ireland in Mayo. I'm uh, staying with my parents. Um, and we have many community members who, who perhaps are living, um, you know, in, in the closet with family members or at home. But maybe due to COVID have been forced to, to go home. And every day they're, they're either working or studying or, or trying to survive this pandemic without being able to fully be themselves. Um, we also have, and, and I'm hearing so many cases here in Ireland where trans um, appointments um, for, for medical supports and mental health supports have been canceled due to COVID and that there's been no follow-up in terms of dates. And that's a, that's a tremendous, um, tremendous issue for citizens who are literally just either starting the journey of transitioning or are in the midst of it or um, or thinking about it and are looking out for help. Now here in Ireland, um, our Minister for Health has has increased online mental health supports um, for those who, who feel um, they, they need them through online, you know, like Zoom calls and, and phone calls and that's great. Um, but we, we need to get people back up and feeling themselves and supporting themselves. Um, and we need the employees and the employers to work together um, within that as, as well as, as well as as of course government, um, you know, we, I don't have to quote too many statistics that say, you know, LGBTQI community members are most at risk, of, unfortunately, of self-harm uh, due to uh, their sexuality or due to the pressures that they feel of, of coming out um, or come out and don't feel the supports there. Um, and we need to protect those, we need to protect our citizens as best as we can. Um, and just having uh, mental health and talking about it, being vulnerable with it, um, destigmatizing the fact that each and every one of us, again, regardless of color, creed, orientation, has mental health. Um, and once we start lifting those barriers, um, we'll we'll have a more inclusive, more comfortable society, um, which is which I think is utopia for for many of us. Boris, what concerns do you share about uh, disproportionate impacts of of the pandemic on the community? Well. Um... Actually, I really second what Maria is saying, but also uh, what I'm really afraid of is the impact uh, the coronavirus has on the economies around the world. People are losing their jobs. The uh, unemployment rate will rise and it will, it will be terrible. Um, and in such a situation where we need to rebuild our economies, um, it should be really, really important that no one should be left behind. And so the LGBTQ community, which has always been vulnerable in terms of discrimination in the workplace, should really be included in all these measures and all these policies in order to recreate the uh, economy. Um, and therefore, I was very glad to read the Supreme Court's uh, decision of last week, I believe it was, mm -hmm. And, and Senator Weiner was also referring to it, where um, the Supreme Court said in a six to three a decision that um, discrimination in the workplace based on sexual orientation or gender identity is not allowed. 
of course, that needs to be translated into legislation. But of course, it's a very important step. And I, I hope that this will be some kind of uh, landmark decision also in other countries when it comes to uh, those huge unemployment figures and, you know, that LGBTQ people will not be discriminated against when uh, new jobs are created and people need to be hired again. Uh, so it's very important that we are mindful that we will not get this huge setback simply because the coronavirus hurt our economy. Sure. We had an interesting audience submitted question um, and Senator Weiner actually touched on this one too. In terms of surgeries on intersex youth, um, these are uh, genitalia normalizing, quote unquote, normalizing surgeries. They're medically unnecessary. Um, what are your concerns on that issue? Do you share his desire to outlaw some of these surgeries? Well, I know that uh, Human Rights Watch, and I worked for Human Rights Watch uh, for 12 years, the LGBT program there, they published a wonderful report uh, written together with an intersex, a US intersex organization, and they are advocating for a ban on a surgery on intersex babies, like uh, Senator Wiener said. And I'm aware of the fact that um, in some European countries, there is already legislation, for instance, in Malta, there is legislation against surgery on intersex uh, babies. But unfortunately, I have to say that even in the Netherlands or Germany, um, uh, it sometimes still happens and people are uh, still thinking very binary when a baby is born, is it a boy or is it a girl? And if it's not really clear, then we have to do something, which is really ridiculous. And so what I hope is that an international movement um, will um, emerge uh, supporting intersex rights, and it would be wonderful if uh, those surgeries will be banned until the person is old enough uh, to say, uh, maybe it's, it's, it's fine with me if uh, there are some medical changes. But um, I don't think parents and a parental right is that strong that a parent can decide for a baby, we have to do surgery in such a case. Of course, there are some, uh, it's a very complicated issue, but there are, of course, some um, bodily um, aspects that are need to be treated and also by surgery. But um, in, in many cases, it's really not necessary and we should you know, leave the binary of male, female and be more open to other um, parts of nature. And yeah, Dustin, just come in there. I, 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 fully, I fully agree with, with Boris. I think now is the time, particularly around intersex, that um, to, to be quite blunt and we, we shut up and listen. We listen to those who um, are stakeholders. We listen to our citizens who've gone through it um, and had, had the choice taken from them versus being in, in very much at the center of it. Um, unless health emergency uh, is required or intervention is required, then, then that person should decide for themselves. Um, but it really boils down to, I think, education. Um, in, in really educating people on what intersex actually means, what LGBTQI means, um, what a parent doesn't have to decide, um, and what a what a child should when in when when they're old enough to do so, or when they're comfortable enough to do so. This is where we we lean back into education and, and actually listen. But also educating, uh, let's say, uh, doctors, because the doctor has always the intention, you know, I want to help my patient, and so let's do surgery. But no, uh, stepping back and relax, that's also something, uh, well, would be part of a good education. And, and I should add that this question actually came from someone in Ireland, and they said that they had they had, they had undergone one of these cosmetic surgeries as a child, and now as an adult, they regret that this happened to them. Do you think there's any particular momentum in Ireland or the European Union to pass a broader law on this, Maria, do you think? Yeah, absolutely. And, and um, delighted to see uh, Irish are interacting. That's, that's great. We're, we're, uh, Robert will be proud that the patriotic duty was uprising for, for him um, <laughs> uh, and for this very important issue. But yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, we, we, 
we as a community in Ireland and and uh, and actually I think Boris you had mentioned it earlier it's like we we get so far around marriage referendum um, and now we have we're, we're not even 20 percent of the way I think we, we still have to look at the education and supports around intersex uh, we have to protect our trans community and ensure that they are getting as much support as, as they can and that they want. So we have a long road to go um, and the European Union and Ireland as, as a member state of that needs to, um, needs to actually listen to the, 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 our citizens who are calling for it. And that's, I mean, back to your question around the, the, the wave of influence um, coming from, from what we see either left or right of us. Um, the, people's movements, grassroots movements are the most powerful. And fortunately, um, history gets to show that as politicians and as governments, we're, we're, we're usually in, in the human rights conversation, a step or two behind where I hope in intersex and trans, um, we actually fall in step here and we fall in step really quickly. Well, in Europe, there's this organization, ILGA Europe, and they make a benchmark. They publish it each year where they compare all European countries with their legislation on trans rights, intersex rights, LGBT rights. And the interesting thing is this starts some kind of competition between the countries. For instance, I was there when uh, the report was uh, published and it was handed to the Dutch Minister of Education. And then she looked at the list and she said, what, is Belgium uh, above us on the list? Belgium was number five and the Netherlands was number eight or something. And she said, we cannot let that happen. And so she said, what, what do we need to adjust our legislation in order to be above Belgium? And I thought that was actually wonderful. Because it's nothing like a bit of competition to, exactly to drive some change. For human, a competition <laughs> yeah. for human rights. Yeah, as, as long as the results are okay. That would be perfect. So that's interesting and it makes it also visible for members of national parliaments um, to see where they are. Uh, because usually you're, you're so focused on your national agenda. And so it's wonderful if there are NGOs who can compare the situation in different countries and stimulate um, new ideas. Um, well, building on that spirit, let's get to our last question here. Um, in the spirit of building this transatlantic rainbow, uh, what, what message do you want people to walk away with as they go into Pride in Dublin and San Francisco this weekend? Is there a certain call to action or spirit you'd like them to take with them? Well, will I let Boris go first? Sure, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, his, his speech is going to be much more inspiring than mine, so I'm going to, I'm going to let oh. him go and then I'll copy from him. <laughs> oh, th that is so mean what you're doing. <laughs> now, you raise the expectations and now I have to come up with a great answer. Well, you know what I've, well, this is actually a personal frustration, which I now um, make it to a, a general level. But um, what I find interesting is that a lot of younger people have no clue how difficult it was uh, for um, you know uh, older uh, LGBTQ people to pave the way. <clears throat> and um, for instance, this was something I thought was really interesting: is uh, there was a, a group of young people coming to the Dutch Parliament to the Senate, and um, marriage equality uh, was one of the topics. And then one of the girls said is it true there was a time that uh, gay and lesbian couples could not get married? And then somebody else said, yes, yes. And then she said, but that's discrimination. And they didn't even realize there was a time, you know, uh, marriage equality did not exist. And when you talk to people uh, also in Europe, they do not understand that, for instance, in the 20s in Germany, um, Magnus Hirschfeld and others we're really doing research on LGBT rights. And, um, you know, they started actually the whole movement in the world. And so what uh, my message would be, and I'm trying to uh, formulate it while I'm speaking, is uh, some intergenerational um, <clears throat> understanding. Young people, older people, everybody should uh, be part of this family tree uh, within, the, within the LGBTQ community and should be aware that there was really a struggle also in the 80s with AIDS and so many uh, people fell, vic fell victim to AIDS and the, the uh, very low 
participation of governments in fighting uh, the AIDS pandemic, at, uh, especially in the beginning. Um, so people should realize, um, you know, people gave their lives in order to achieve uh, equal rights and e full equality. And so my message would be, be aware of the past and let the past and inspire you for the future. Maria, anything you'd like to add on that idea? Of oh, well, now I put myself under pressure because I, I, uh, <laughs> I, 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 I made Boris go before me but I mean I can't I can't say it better than 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 what Boris just shared I think we have such a broad church um LGBTQI plus goes beyond just the letters that are included in 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 this event or or in the the movement that it is and we need to have as Boris shared we need to have levels of understanding and and appreciation of where we came from um you know i remember standing uh in in a gay bar in philadelphia um in downtown in the rainbow district and um asking a bartender why on a absolutely wet day evening it was raining from the heavens i thought i was in ireland um <laughs> i said why are you keeping the doors and the windows open like would, would you not be closing them and he goes um and he was this beautiful older gay man that he said, I was in here when uh, it had to be locked and dark at all times. Oh. Um, so regardless of the weather outside, um, we, we are so much brighter and happier um, because we can be who we want to be. And, and that just sparked my own interest and in understanding of, of the history of the men and women and, and our trans communities and communities as a whole, our allies in particular, who, who really pushed for us uh, for me to be able to say, you know, I'm, I'm lesbian and I can stand on a stage in a, what is deemed a very Irish festival called the Rosa Chile and feel welcomed in the country uh, that I was educated in. Um, and it all sparks down to education, interest, continuous this movement, um, making sure within the community we're inclusive, because I think at times in the community mm. we, we, we might get a little bit too judgmental <laughs> when in actual fact we're asking for... for um, acceptance of ourselves and, and understanding of ourselves and, and the world around us. Um, from, from what I would hope as a transatlantic rainbow community, um, I hope we learn from each other. I hope we're one part of this world, of this globe is not moving, a, spearing ahead in trans, um, in, in, in trans community rights, in Black Lives Matters, in discrimination, uh, and the others not, that we're doing it in unison. So that our citizens, regardless of where they may travel from, as I said earlier, is, is not uh, starting from scratch if they decide to move to the parts of the United States or move to parts of the European Union. We need, we need to do this together as a collective movement. Well, thank you for ending us on such a powerful note there. That was fantastic. <laughs> Um, well, thank you both for joining us, Boris Dietrich, Maria Walsh. It's been it's been great. I'm going to throw it back to the the Dutch consulate um, of the Netherlands. He's going to close us out with. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dustin, and uh, I'm very honored to close this special event. And thank you all for this powerful discussion. Promoting LGBTQ rights is a central theme in Dutch government policies within the Netherlands and abroad. And as the first country to legalize same-sex marriage, the Netherlands is on the forefront of the LGBTQ plus acceptance worldwide. And uh, Senator Boris Dietrich told us about his efforts and shared uh, the feeling that there's now a global movement coming up and even told us a bit about the competition between member states, which I think is a great thing to improve. And today we joined two other front runners, Ireland and California. And as we discussed, more progress is needed. And I do hope that together we can continue to push these efforts in the United States, in Europe, and all over the globe. And Senator Wiener said, we're not even close to be done. While Member of the European Parliament, Maria Wells added, well, Pride is a protest movement and work on the education of Pride history is needed. So I think we had a very interesting and powerful debate. And I'd like to thank the California Legislative LGBTQ Plus Caucus, and of course, our speakers today, Maria Wells, Scott Wiener, and Boris Dietrich. I specifically want to thank you for your leadership on this important topic. The Netherlands, Ireland, California look different because of you. And of course, I'd like to thank our moderator, Dustin Gardner. I would like to thank you for your expertise and your guidance in this debate. And a special thank you to Robert, and the team of the Consulate uh, of Ireland for bringing, of course, everybody together today. 
and I'm looking forward to really marching again in Market Street next year with our friends from the European Union. Um, but until then, of course, I do hope that we can expand on this webinar and continue to build the transatlantic rainbow. The Netherlands and California are strong partners on many different levels, from LGBTQ plus rights to climate change. We often share the same views. Amsterdam and San Francisco already share a bond, a deep bond, both as gay capitals, where many people find a freedom that they cannot find in their hometown. And I fondly remember the, um, the Amsterdam rainbow dress being displaced here at City Hall in San Francisco. And both cities as well are working together on the HIV AIDS prevention and are reaching out to the most vulnerable populations. You know, the last AIDS conference was in Amsterdam and this year's would have been in San Francisco. And then the Netherlands and Ireland, well, we have a strong bond within the European uh, Union and hosting this webinar, I think, underlines our strength and our growing partnership. So thank you all for joining us today and participating. It truly shows that orange, green and gold are all part of the rainbow. And I'm looking forward to the next steps. Thank you again and have a wonderful Pride. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Pride. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, guys. It was a pleasure.